I was confronted by a severe looking scientist who asked me where I thought I was going. I found his line of questioning interesting. Existential, almost. I was so stunned I couldn't speak. Are you okay? Asked Heather. Mum told Dr. Heddle he really shouldn't force a power cycle on you robots. I don't think she recognized me. But eventually I got enough strength up to speak. However, all that came out was... Heather... As for the old lady, I don't know how but she recognized me as soon as I walked through the door of their living quarters. They both smiled when I told them how everyone else had worked together to create a distraction at the base's main gate. Well, said the old lady, we've been looking for an excuse to escape, Heather, grab your things and we'll get going.
the single bored looking guard stood between us and the exit, all the other soldiers must have been at the main gate, either being entertained or annoyed by Mr. Silton and the others. How do we get past him then? whispered Heather as we crept closer. The old lady smiled, I'll create a distraction and you two run for it, she said. No mum, said Heather, if we're leaving, you're coming too. But Mr. Logan soon solved our dilemma. As we quietly jogged through the exit, Mr. Silton and the others tore round the corner in the van before screeching to a halt. All the while Mr. Preston shouting and gesturing for us to get in. When things had finally quietened down, I asked Heather what was going on. It all changed after Dad died, she said, explaining that because the professor didn't want anything to do with me. The old man's financial investors split the company into 12 divisions and began manufacturing all sorts of robots. So the old man, he was actually my creator, my maker, I suppose a more poetic man might have called him, my father. Soon, the robots were sold to every country, Heather continued, saying that when a small skirmish in the Middle East turned into a global war, every country started using robotic troops. In literally less than a day, every country's robots realized that the other robots were not the problem, the humans were, and, very logically deserted, with disastrous consequences. It suddenly all made sense. What the professor had said, all the other robots, and why no one ever wanted to talk about the war when I was around. All of a sudden, Alice shouted for everyone to hold on, we were being followed. I'd never really considered the idea of God, but I actually prayed that Heather was okay. We'd fallen pretty far out of the van and I wasn't sure I'd really braced her fall. Heather greeted me with a calm smile. I thought you'd find me easier than I'd find you, so I thought I'd stay put. I made a small shelter as quick as I could. It was soon pitch black and starting to rain so Heather had suggested we rest. In the morning when there would be better light, we could try to find our way home. I don't think Dad ever imagined this would happen, said Heather with a sad look in her eye. I mean, he would always talk about how he'd dreamt of a robot when he was a young boy. He and Mum were so happy when you finally turned up. I honestly think he thought robots like you could help the world. Not kill millions of people. Death is really sad, I said. It was an obvious thing to say, but Heather nodded. When my best friend died, she continued, I asked Mum why people had to die. She said it was to make room for new babies to be born. I don't know why, but this made me feel both happy and sad, at the same time.
Mr. Preston practically fell through a bush as he said, There you are. We've been looking for you all night. He explained that they had lost the soldiers but the van had broken down. Luckily though, it was actually only a short walk away. I must have looked sad when we got back, as the old lady sat down beside me. What's the matter? she asked. I told her that Heather had explained the war to me. The old lady sighed, it's not your fault. Before saying how the original idea was for the robots to be raised like children learning and developing their own consciousness. But, when the old man died and I was shut down, my consciousness was taken, hacked, and copied to every other robot, to bypass the growing up stage. Heather explained that every robot had a tiny bit of my memories, of the old man, the house, of everything. So when the war broke out, hundreds of unstable robots kept arriving at their house. I think it was like some kind of pilgrimage for them, said the old lady. That's why we created a scrambling signal, it only works within a few hundred miles, but turns any unlicensed or illegal robots close enough into mindless zombies. That's another reason we were surprised to see you. Heather explained how most of the planet had been taken over by robots. She said they were looking for more people, but it wasn't looking good. They had received a radio signal from Japan, there was a few thousand people who survived there. Lord knows how, said the old lady, their robots outnumbered people 50 to 1 by the time the war broke out. Heather said how she had been writing a virus that would shut any robot down, I'm not really a great coder, she said, mom was trying to work out a way to boost the scrambling signal, but now you're here I've got an idea. The old lady smiled and slowly nodded, we should be able to clone your personality and broadcast your consciousness to all the other robots. Heather smiled. We'll make them all nice. Robot, interrupted Mr. Silton, we're nearly done, but we're all starving, see if you can catch us one of them rabbits. So, it must have been several years since the old man had died. It was strange. Heather was now as tall as me, if not taller. But at least everyone was back together. I was so happy for the first time in ages. I just knew everything was going to be alright. After all, all we needed to do was save the world. Or at least help put it back together. I suddenly realized what Mr. Silton meant by, we're all starving. When I got back, I told everyone that I couldn't catch anything. I don't think anyone was too disappointed.
In the morning, Simon Dallas brought the blind man to the house. Despite his lack of sight, he was quite the computer expert. He talked the others through the process of setting up a video phone. He said it should serve our purpose, but the low bit rate might make everyone's faces look a bit blocky. The device soon crackled into life. Hello Nighthawk. This is Dr. Hero of Japan. Are you receiving me? Over. Hello, said the old lady. This is Nighthawk. It's good to speak to you again. Dr. Hero explained that something had gone wrong and the enemy robots had nearly breached their defenses. We have everything we need to broadcast our nice virus and make the robots far more passive. It might take a few months. Can you hold out until then? Dr. Hero sighed. Well, we'll have to. I spent the rest of that day helping Sim and the blind man set up a computer with what they called the Internet. The planet might have been ravaged by war, but this allowed people to communicate with each other. The old lady was concerned about viruses and other technical sounding things, explaining that they might infect me. But Mr. Silton talked right over her, as he convinced everyone it was a great idea. It was amazing. When Heather and I looked at it, there was nothing but video games and awesome cartoons. When Mr. Preston looked, it was all strange conspiracies and ghosts. Mr. Logan saw guns. Alice saw that her church was having a summer fate. For Mr. Deck it was operas and subtitled films. But when Mr. Silton looked at it, I was shocked to find the entire thing was full of naked ladies. Later that evening, Mr. Silton wheeled an old piano into the room. Heather smiled as she explained that her parents had bought it for her, when she had seen it in an old junk shop. As a thank you, she had written a piece of music for her parents, which one day she tried to play for them. For some reason, she then gave me a huge hug and suggested I might like to play the piano with her. As happy as the old lady was with us playing the piano, we soon got back to business. After scanning the house, she explained that, other than the escaped nanobots, there were four test robots that I would have to track down. They had each taken important satellite parts that we would need to broadcast the nice virus and we had to get these parts back to the hallway with the rest of our equipment. If you're going to explore the house, said Mr. Silton, you should know some of the doors have been boarded up. Here, take my crowbar. Oi, that's mine, laughed Mr. Preston. You said you didn't take it, you really are a proper c. 
Mr. Preston explained that they had used it in what he called their old business. I soon realized this meant all sorts of robbery, but he said that they'd given that all up after falling out with their old gang of associates. Although Mr. Preston's story was very interesting, Sim and the blind man had something even more interesting for me, something they called an auto-map.